Hello, everyone, and welcome to Ventures. This episode with Moshe Engelberg is a bit different. He has written this amazing book called The Amare Wave, and it is all about infusing love into business. If you think about it, a lot of warlike imagery, metaphors are used when talking about business. And it's a, it's a fascinating heuristic to think about, do we actually love our customers? Do our customers love us? How does this implicate how we think about growing our business in terms of revenues? And we talk about the fact that if you really philosophically think about it, all businesses actually have a social mission. That they're actually trying to create social value for the world. And, and we discuss that at length in this podcast and get, dive into a lot of details that I think would be really helpful for entrepreneurs, for people that are supporting entrepreneurs, for people in businesses that are, that are responsible for growing communities and really helping take their business to the next level to ride this, as Moshe talks about, to ride this Amare wave, which in culture, especially the last 10 years, has been awakening, is becoming a thing where we are, are infusing more love into what we do. So if you are watching this episode, you can also listen anywhere that you get your podcasts. You could just search for ventures. And if you're listening, you can also watch by visiting wclittle.com. And there you'll see more extensive show notes and, and links to the different things that we talk about in this episode. So with that, please enjoy this conversation with Moshe Engelberg. All right, Moshe, welcome to the show. Thank you. Good to be here with you, Will. I'm excited about this conversation because, you know, in the last 10 years especially, but really in large part since the 60s, our, our country and the world has been going through a new type of cultural revolution. And in the last 10 years especially has been showing us a lot of unconscious bias that we have across gender, sexuality, race, a lot of the other isms that we talk about. And as I was reading your book, The Amare Wave, who, that I'd highly recommend to all, everyone listening and watching, I realized there's a whole other set of unconscious bias that we have, and that is around using warlike metaphors, warlike language in business. And so I feel like your book is yet another and very important part of this cultural revolution as it infuses all parts of our, of our, of our culture, professionally, personally, uh, and I, I'm really looking forward to have a conversation with you ab about that. So I appreciate you carving out time here. Sure. Happy to be here. I'm looking forward to this. So yeah, I'd love to just start to tell us a little bit about, about your story. Like wh where, do you, where do you come from? What kind of things do you work on in your career? And what ultimately led to the book? Sure. Well, three main things led to writing the book. Um, I'll answer your question a little bit in reverse. Sure. Uh, the, the first thing was... I remember being with a client, a uh, senior product manager who said to me, Moshe, we hate our customers. And, and it was really striking. And, and I knew it to be true for this division within the company. It was a large um, health technology company. And the, the, the word, again, the words he used was, were particularly striking and not dramatic. This wasn't a guy who did drama, it was, it was the truth. And unfortunately, in their case, they still made money. Mm. So they, 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 that led them to continue as they were. But, but the notion of we do that, we come to work, we have this purpose, we do what we do every day, and yet we hate the people we're here to serve, it was really striking. And I thought about, and I thought, well, a lot of companies aren't exactly feeling love for their customers. One, one, one person put it this way. This would be so much easier if we just didn't have to deal with those damn customers. <laughs> and and yes, yeah, sometimes it's true. Customers are difficult. And when they complain, it's it's hard. And sometimes our complaints are unfounded. Sometimes they're, they're founded and appropriate and so on. But that whole notion of calling, calling into play the relationship between the company and the customers. And that led me to start thinking, well, what if it was the opposite? What if it was love? So that was one piece. Another piece was what you referred to as the, the language, the predatory or even violent language of business. We're gonna crush our competition, we're gonna capture market share. It's this notion that we own our customers, we bend them to our will. 
and we don't even think about it. We, we, and, and I'm guilty of that too. I've told many a client saying, okay, we'll help you capture market share and didn't even think about what that means. <laughs> and, and now I think about it. So that was the second piece. And the third piece was more personal. It was my own spiritual journey of many years. I've been a meditator for 30, 40 years. Mm -hmm. And on this spiritual path, it to me is very important. And recognizing the unity and the oneness that brings us all together, the commonality that we all share, which is in contrast to the divisiveness that's been emphasized in our culture, particularly in recent years, and calls into, into play these different dichotomies that, that you and I talked about a bit earlier. So it was a combination of this spiritual journey of seeing the commonalities and the, the, the unity, the potential for that, the predatory language of business, and then this notion of hating or loving customers. And that led to the fundamental insight, business is missing love. And in short, the research I did made very clear, coupled with my three decades of doing consulting, that companies that put love to work from the get-go, from the outset for founders, do better. Mm. They prosper more. Employees are happier and more loyal. Customers are become the evangelists and ambassadors. And founders and leaders say okay this is why i'm here i'm fulfilling my purpose i love what i do so it came down to the benefit of of challenging the what i call the warlike paradigm and replacing with the love-based paradigm so that's why i wrote the book backing up into that early in my career the driving force was frustration and i kept saying there's got to be a better way and i was primarily in the health space i'm a what I call a recovered health educator and, and kept looking for more tools to instead of trying to shove, shove things down people's throats. Okay, do this. Here's how, here's how to eat. Here's how to exercise. Here's how to do, do these things. So you won't die early. And so early in my career, frustration was the driving force. There's got to be a better way. And I was in that healthcare field where we would often tell people what to do in order for them to have a better life, eat, eat better, exercise more, do whatever. So I kept going back to school for more tools, as I mentioned, and that frustration as a driving force shifted over time, over many years, to a more compassionate approach to seeing how hard it is to run companies, to make these tough decisions, to, to live in alignment with our values. And so that's been, that's in brief a story of my career. And the work I did as a consultant was fundamentally helping people figure out what serves our customers. Why are we here and what do we do that matters? It ties into some of Jim Collins' early work and, and others about finding the sweet spot. What are we passionate about? What are we the best at? What drives our economic engine? And I bring love into that equation. So that's that's kind of a snapshot of where I've been and how I got to where things are now. So these dichotomies that that uh, that you referred to earlier, I think we we talked about that before we hit record. But it 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 really at 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 Proto Ventures, the the group that I'm involved with, where we uh, have a studios division, a labs division, and a ventures division, where we invest in companies coming out of our labs and studios. We have this, it, it's, a, it's a larger group that, that is a combination of a professional network and providing these services in venture capital. And we have these tensions that we hold between capitalism, socialism, between centralization and decentralization, between having autonomy and operating under a single brand. And as we've been having these, these conversations about how do, we, how do we work together to achieve our vision of investing holistically in entrepreneurs to bring about human flourishing. As we go about the, the process of, of getting after our, our, our purpose statement, as we hold these things in tension, we found recently that conversations around your book have been extremely in, enlightening. And so I'd love to hear, I'd love to hear from you just maybe even to dive into a, a bit of the outline. Like, why did you even structure the book that you, that, that you wrote here? And, and what, if you were to sort of summarize, I know this is a big question, or you summarize kind of the, 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 the main talking points 
along the way. And then we can kind of dive into the different sections as we go. Right, right. Well, the book, I happen to have a copy right here. The book has four main parts. And the first part is, is kind of providing context, setting the stage for this wave is here. I call the book the Amare wave. Amare is Latin for love. And the wave is to signify that this is happening. Mm. There's more and more companies doing this and founders and leaders who want to do this, who say, I don't want to get in that trap of losing sight of why we're here. What gets me excited of this purpose we feel a strong connection with and that it, and that fulfills my life and, and drives me forward. And, and knowing that in startups and a lot of more mature companies that happen just because of the workload. It, it's so how to avoid that. So a lot of people want to avoid that in this wave, this growing wave of companies is happening. So in my book, I'm not inventing anything new. It's it's creation and that it's connecting dots in a different way mm. and putting it under this larger umbrella. I'm calling Amari. And the wave, some people catch the wave and they call it conscious capitalism or servant leadership or doing good or whatever. And to me, the title doesn't matter. I offer the Amari way as a framework and there's many and they share fundamental ideas. And so this book is organized around those ideas. First, again, uh, sets the context and that starts with saying the wave is here and giving evidence to that effect. And then the second chapter is, will this make money? And the short answer is yes. Companies that do this typically make more money, often a lot more money. Originally, Will, that chapter was way like chapter eight or nine. Mm. And I realized in doing the research for this that no matter what someone's orientation is, one of the very first questions is, will this make money? I was talking to someone who is a mid-level executive at... Um, Facebook, who said, yeah, this sounds great, but unless it makes money, no one's going to give a shit. It's just, it's not going to happen. So I recognize that the, the need to make the business case that this makes money. Mm -hmm. and, and then the third chapter, and to wrap up the first part, the context is stepping back 10,000 years to what some call the agricultural revolution and a big shift in paradigm to say this warlike approach has been going along going on a long time and we're at a point in society where technology has developed so much that we could effectively destroy our world very quickly we're sort of doing it in a slow way with a climate crisis and so on but but we're at a point where we need to make some fundamental decisions about how we be and how we do so the third chapter in the first section is about more an evolutionary perspective going back ten thousand years to what some call the agricultural revolution and where there was this notion of abundance for some and scarcity for the rest and how that really shifted things and is, is still the paradigm we're living in. And, and we know that with the 1% and the 99% and so on and where greed takes hold. So it's looking back historically, calling on Darwin and others and saying, there's a historical perspective for all this and it's time to change. There's a convergence of, of technology and other forces that are saying, if we don't change up something now, we could, we could really be destroying our world. So let's change it and let's be happier along the way. So that's the first part of the book. That's the context, the wave is here. Yeah, you make more money doing this and historically it's time. We need to let go of Milton Friedman, reconsider Darwin, move past this warlike mentality and really shift the paradigm. Mm. And then the second part of the book goes into how we operate as human beings and how human nature makes it easy to be fearful and, and come from that, that restrictive fear energy, which affects the decisions we make and gives us a lack of trust and how things unfold. And there's not enough. I have to get mine. And if you get yours, then there won't be enough for me. That whole mentality, which I believe is a false premise underneath it. And shifting into how we how we can can hold on to 
different beliefs. So citing, for example, the notion of cognitive dissonance, which ties into this idea Will mentioned earlier about holding dichotomies. So it happens, we have dissonance theory that tells us we want to be consistent. We want our thoughts to be aligned. We want our behaviors and beliefs to be consistent. And it turns out we have a, a tremendous capacity as human beings for inconsistency. So how many of us say, for example, yeah, I should eat better and don't do it. I should exercise every day and don't do it. I should treat my family members. I should do this. I should. So we all have these shoulds that we don't do, even though we believe life would be better if we did. So we are blessed or cursed with the capacity to tolerate much dissonance, to compartmentalize things. And so it's it's call, it's shining a light on that and saying, you know, here, here's a way through that. So the second part of the book is how this business of war paradigm came to be. And, and um, I, I use analogs with reading from a manual from the US Marines and substituting the notion of war for the notion of business and, and saying, how does this sound? How does this fit? <laughs> And, uh, and, and it moves from the psychology of the warlike approach to business into part three, which is what I call the Amari way, which are principles and pillars for putting this to work. And then the, fir- the fourth part is some of the barriers, the status quo bias, this it, the attachment to outcomes where we mistakenly equate our self-worth with the results we get and so on. So that's generally the structure of the book. That's great. So how specifically for a, a founder that is building a new business and building up their team and sort of laying down the initial foundations for their business, how, how should those people read this book? Like what, what are some principles for the, the earliest stages of starting a business that you think are, are worth highlighting here? Well, the first one is your higher purpose. Hmm. And, and this gets to a premise that challenges fundamentally what business is and why it exists. So I'll I'll step back to macro view for a moment and then dive more deeply into specific things for founders. So why does business exist? Business is an enterprise. It's easy to think it exists to provide shareholder value or make money or things along those lines. To me, those are byproducts, critically important byproducts. We have to have them. No margin, no mission, as the saying goes. We need them. And I see money as a good thing. The more we have, the more good we can do with it. But business exists to make life better for people. My contention is, and I say this to every founder, that you started this to make things better in some way, to solve some problem that will ultimately improve life for people in whatever capacity. That's why you you saw an opportunity for improvement to remove pain and suffering and replace it with a better way. Remember that, hold on to that. That's why you exist. And if you can keep that as your guiding force, what I, what I would call your higher purpose, it'll make a lot of your decisions much easier because you'll wanna make sure your decisions are aligned with why you exist and you don't lose sight of it and start making compromises in your core values that just are not right for you. Mm. So that's that's the first piece is, is recognize your higher purpose and honor it and speak it to the world. Here's why we exist. This is why we're here. When you buy this product, it's connecting the product with that that outcome. And 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 remembering that and and again, sticking to it. So that's number one. Number two is putting money in its proper pers- perspective. So every founder, most every founder is looking for money. And sometimes things are bootstrapped in the beginning and then, and then maybe they are fortunate to find Proda and Proda Ventures give some funding once they come out of the lab or the studio or they go to other VC firms or angels, whatever it is. Most founders are looking for money and having to prove their worth. But it's putting money in the proper perspective. As Alexander Dumas said, money makes a bad master, but a good servant, something to that effect. <laughs> and, and, so, and so it's respecting money as an enabler of good 
but not worshiping it. And it's so easy to get caught up in the worship of money. So that's the second one is put money in its proper perspective as something that's really important and valuable and something we respect, but it doesn't rule us. And the third that ties into that is having some notion of what is enough for now. So that's this idea in, in at least in the West, we tend to think more is better, bigger is better. We have to grow, grow, grow. And I'll challenge funders, well not, sorry, founders and others to say, do you need to grow to that extent right now? Of course, you quote unquote want to, maybe you want to be a unicorn. And, but it, does that serve your higher purpose best? And maybe you don't need to grow right now. Maybe you need to stay put for a while and get solid in your principles and your product and so on. And so it's questioning what is enough and recognizing that and this is sort of a Buddhist perspective of if you're always seeking more, no matter how much you have, it won't be enough. Mm. When you have the next thing, well, now I need that. Now I need money for that. Now I need that. So it's this notion of there is this thing called enough and recognize what that is for you. So those sound those may sound somewhat philosophical. There, there's a whole other set of things we can move into, but I'll stop there for just a moment. Yeah, I mean, that is profound. I mean, I, I, part of what I think attracts founders to be working with our organization, other organizations that I say are riding the wave, it, are that we do talk about the philosophical, the heart, mental illness. We talk about the, the why behind, why are you starting this business? Why, why, is this, why does this business exist? And I like what you said earlier. I don't, I don't know if I've done a lot of reflecting on that in terms of just what is the existential purpose of business in general, right? If you're creating a product or service, it is to, it is to help. <laughs> it's, yeah. you know, it's either to entertain, which is helpful, uh, or you're providing some kind of product or service that is that, that people are like, yeah, this is worth my money because I'm getting value in, in exchange. So in, in, in a philosophical sense, all business exists to make the world a better place. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <That is. laughs> Exactly. Yeah, no, that's that. That is that is a good. Uh, that, that that's a really that's a really good approach. Well, he, and here, if we take that one step further, will here's what that means. That means business is first and foremost a social enterprise, mm. and secondarily an economic enterprise. Mm. And the only reason we have an economy is to have an engine to run the social enterprise. Mm. But we tend to flip it and think business is the economy and vice versa. It's not. Business is a social enterprise. It builds relationships and improves the quality of life for people and thereby uplifts society. The economy runs that, is the engine that runs that. And somewhere around 40, 50 years ago, economists became prominent in politics and in DC. And that's a good thing. But in my view, there should have been social psychologists in there too. Mm. recognizing what's this all about why like why is government there same thing it's to make life better for people help us manage things and and make good decisions and have a higher quality of life but we forget that and we just get busy and that's where we, it's kind of like a fish is in water a fish doesn't know it's in water it just is mm. and so when we get so myopic we don't recognize that we're in, we don't, it's hard. And, it's, it, and I want to acknowledge this is hard to do to step back to why does business exist? What's the fundamental purpose? And then drill down into why does my business exist? And to keep with that in a culture that doesn't necessarily reward it. That's good. So what do you do if, you, if you're someone who are, is in a business that is all about seemingly all about the money, hates their customers, is using warlike language all over the place or, or master-slave uh, language all over the place. What, what, what do you do? That's, I, I've worked with a number of companies like this yeah. and some have changed and some have not. So it's kind of, it's the idea that even an individual, we all need to have a readiness and a receptivity to change mm. and some of us are heads down no what i'm doing is what i'm doing it's what i've always done and i'm making money so go away it's like not not having the 
space to entertain another possibility. Part of this Amare work is saying there's unlimited possibilities. Let's make space to entertain them without judgment. So when there's companies that are on this of this more warlike path, like you were describing, where it's all about money, it's to ask fundamental questions. Sometimes the first question I'll ask is, so at your company, would you say you love your customers? Mm. And at companies like you're describing, where it's more vicious and sometimes greedy, and it's only about money, it's, we'll love them as, as, as long as they give us our money. Well, that's, <laughs> that's, that's not really love. I define love in this book and throughout as simply energy that uplifts and connects. So it's, are you, are you looking to uplift your customers? Are you creating connection? Which is, as human beings, it's what we all crave. We want connection. We want to see and be seen. And so I'll ask those questions. And sometimes that'll get conversations. Or, do we love our customers? Let's talk about that. And then the second question is, do they love us back? And how do you know? Mm -hmm. Are you just saying yes, or is it true? If it's no, do you care? Do you care if your customers love you back? Sometimes people don't. It's as long as the money's coming in, it's good enough. And I've learned over the years that this is not for everybody right now. I think it could serve everybody, but part of the wave is there's a front edge to the wave. And there's a, there's a kind of wave called a deep water wave. That's kind of a culmination of multiple waves and it goes a long time. So there's opportunity to join at different places, kind of like the, the diffusion of innovations, how people adopt new ideas. Some are at the front edge. Some are going to say, I'm going to wait a while till it's quote unquote safer and more proven. Or, and some will be way behind Sue. And so in 50 or 100 years, they'll be coming on board when this is the new normal. And it doesn't seem like a change. It just seems like, well, it's what everybody does. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's tough in companies that have that that have that mentality because it requires people to basically check their hearts and souls at the door and be a different person saying, don't be you, be somebody different during this time you're at work and relinquish your values and focus on the money. And that's it. And some people can do that. Some people, it tears them apart. Mm. It just tears them apart. So either they fall apart or they find they say i'm going to do this because it pays the bills or whatever they rationalize doing it and say i'm going to find my happiness in other areas of life so they get a boat or they go hiking or they do it whatever and it's good to do that stuff anyway but it's their means of filling up because their work is depleting and i challenge people in that setting and say does this deplete you or fill you up when you go into work does it deplete you or fill you up and if people are depleted, then it's questioning, are you willing to live this way? Is it worth it? And then at least people are conscious about their decisions. And it's tough to change a culture around, but it can be done step by step. It can be done. Yeah. So I'd love, I'd love to dive in a little bit further into the question, do your customers love you? Do they love your business? How, what kind of ways of measuring that, um, encouraging that, do you typically talk to with business executives and managers that you, that you work with? Okay. Well, first I'll give an example, a very concrete example of what I mean by customer to customers love you. And for me, a, a strong one is in, in the realm of groceries and Trader Joe's, which is a chain throughout much of the country, mid-sized grocery chain, that happens to make four to six times more per square foot than most grocery stores. Mm. And when I walk in there, I feel a little bit uplifted. Like, mm. it feels good to be. I'm shopping for groceries, and yet I'm feeling, yeah, I'm happy to be here. Mm. And I feel a sense of connection. Yeah, it's kind of my people, and it's a, a little bit weird maybe or people are wearing their Hawaiian shirts and doing their thing there's a vibe and energy there that I happen to like and feel a connection with and that if I need to know where the stuffed grape leaves are or the artichokes someone will stop what they're doing and walk me over to where it is and make sure I'm happy and when I check out they'll say hey have you ever tried this recipe 
for uh, for when you grill salmon or whatever it is. So there's a there's a lot of connection points that are uplifting. So so that's an experience of love. And when I talk to people at Trader Joe's, they they feel it and they work hard to their structure to generate that experience and sustain it. Mm. So that's what the experience is. In contrast, if I go into most chain, larger chain grocery stores, it's not bad. It's more of a transactional experience. And I'll get what I get and, and I leave, but I'm not uplifted unless occasionally there's the great cashier or, or helper, but that's more the exception rather than, it's not the culture. Mm. It's the individual. At Trader Joe's, it's the culture. Mm. So that's an example of putting love to work being on this Amari wave and generating customer love so they can answer the question definitively, yes, our customers love us. One metric is sales. One metric is customer retention, how often customers come back. Another vehicle is giving customers a megaphone, giving, making it easy for them to voice their love and share it. So like I'm doing that right now by talking about Trader Joe's and I've written about them and I'll tell <clears throat> excuse me, I'll tell friends about them. Mm. So we become megaphones. So I advise founders and leaders to ask themselves the question, what do we do to uplift our customers? How do we, cre how do we create an uplifting experience? And it starts from initial communications. How do we greet people? When they come to us, whether online or brick and mortar or whatever the form, how do we uplift them? How do we make them feel welcome and say, we care about you. We are glad you are here. We recognize you chose us. So there's a lot of ways to do that. Again, from the personal greeting to what the words are, to the feeling in people's hearts when they're doing the work. So in order to love customers, employees need to feel loved. Because for most of us, we can't give what we don't have. So a, a paradoxical example is Amazon, where Amazon wants to be the most customer-centric company in the world, galaxy, universe, whatever <laughs> whatever the, the, they state their domain. But they want to be the most customer-centric company around. And customers, many customers love Amazon. Why? Because it's easy. They make it so easy and they know their customers and you know, good prices and so on. But there's a lot of press about how other than the superstars, a lot of the lower to mid-level people are treated as commodities. There was an article recently about how they look to let go of employees because the churn helps in the long run. I see that as a short-sighted view because employees can be um, trained and supported in a way that they'll be totally loyal. So my belief is to get the ultimate in customer love, we need to really love our employees and show them so they feel uplifted and connected and want to pass that along. So it's this kind of, it's this cycle that keeps growing. And for the founder, it starts actually with self-love. So I will ask founders, do you love you? And that's not a common question. I do a lot of executive coaching and that's not a common question, but I think it's a really important one. Because if as a founder, if you don't love you, where's the foundation, there was the energy to love others wholly and for them to love others and, and create that virtuous cycle that spins up and up. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I love the definition of uplifting and connecting. Like that's, that is a very succinct and clear definition of love. And obviously there's been no lack of spilled ink, you know, uh, <laughs> writing on the topic of love over over the history of humanity uh, why why did you specifically decide on that definition what what was it about love and the way that you're thinking about it that that led to those uplifting and connecting i love that question thank you that's it gets at something really important first off i chose to be rigorous i want to hold my hold myself to be accountable to give a rigorous definition of love mm. it's easy to talk about love there's a song a ballad my parents used to sing when i was a kid called love is a many splendored thing that there's many aspects to love and it's true but i figured and this came out of my phd training about 
was called concept explication. Be really clear about what you're talking about and define it so it can be operationalized, which in plain language means know what you're talking about and make it obvious so there's no confusion. So first off, I chose to be rigorous about a definition. I chose the two aspects, connection and uplifting, uh, based in large part on my personal experience and professional experience working with people that as human beings, I mentioned this earlier, we share a core need, a fundamental need to feel connection, to feel something more than ourselves. And it's just how we are wired as a species, where we are a social species. So the connection is, again, fundamental. And the uplifting is the positive aspect of energy up. That, that, that's, and that's an easy metric, even on a subjective level, to know. So when I'm in Trader Joe's, I can, I can tune in and say, yeah, my energy is going up. When I'm do, doing this other thing, feel my energy going down or if I'm around certain people, my energy might go down. I choose to have uplifting experiences. So I felt the emotional uplift, energy going, energy spinning upward is, is a fundamental aspect of a positive experience and I'm choosing to label love. So that's how I glued together the connecting and uplifting as the two core aspects of what I'm calling love. It's good. It's good. Now, I, I'm curious, there, there's a time for war, right? If, if, if people are coming and, and killing your family and friends, there's a time to take up arms and protect yourself. I don't know if by extension, if there are, if there are people who are perpetuating hate is there a time for war against that hate? Is there a time to be anti-racist, for example? And, and how, do, how would you hold that in, in, in tension with, with your writing? Or is, this, or is this part of love? Is, 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 is this part of it? I mean, how, do you, how, do, how do you address that, that general question line? Well, the short answer is yes. They're like the, is it the Psalm to every season? Um, yeah, I'm not remembering the yeah, details. Ecclesiastes. Yeah, Ecclesiastes. Yeah, there's yeah, Ecclesiastes. Time, yeah. Time for, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's seasons for everything, and war and hatred are, we have the capacity for it. We, we, we're granted with that ability, so we need to deal with it. It will come up. And I, I wrestled with this when writing the book, the idea of, am I going to make a claim that there exists fundamental evil in the world. And I think I'll take an extreme example of jihadists who we would call terrorists who are going to destroy and kill in order to advance what they believe is right. So from my perspective, it can appear evil. Like, how can they do that? Just come and kill my community and, and say, this is to honor God. And yet I recognize from their point of view, they have a purpose they are so devoutly attached to that they'll give up their own life and the life of their comrades and others. So is it my place to call that evil? And it gets really difficult, but we have to, we have to set some boundary and proclaim some things as I'm calling that bad or evil Otherwise, there's no contrast. If everything is good, we don't experience it. So we need contrast to experience uplift, to experience connection. And that's where the notion of war comes in. So there will be war. If someone's attacking my family or community, you bet I'll defend them. And I'll do whatever it takes. But that's different than using war as a means to impose my will on others because I'm saying my way is better than their way. And historically, that's what war has been about. Mm. Our way's better, let we're gonna impose it on others. In business, does war belong? And I would say no. Mm. It doesn't mean competition doesn't belong. Competition is great in business. And Bill Gates acknowledged this once of saying, competition brings out our best, it makes us better. We don't have to hate our competitors. competitors. We don't have to, 
mm. want them to be pulverized or eviscerated. And some leaders use words like that and are seeking pleasure from the total destruction of the enemy. They're not our enemies. In some forms, they're our collaborators because they're making us better. Mm. So I think in, in the world, we're going to have war. Hopefully it's less and less, but it's also a way of cleansing. I, I like to say Hinduism, which has a lot of deities, and three of the main deities is a guide of creation, a guide of sustaining, and a guide of destruction. So in that religion and culture, there's a recognition that destruction is absolutely necessary and a good thing. It's good because it makes space for something new. Mm. If nothing is destroyed, there's no space for creation. And a mistake, my belief, a mistake we made in 2008 with the big recession was not allowing things that were broken to fall down. Mm. We, we rescued them and, and we rewarded some terrible behavior and saying, well, you're too big to fail. We just can't let that happen. We could have let that happen. Things fall apart. Societies fall apart. Marriages fall apart. Planets, it, it's just the nature of existence of, of there's creation, there's growth, there's sustaining, and there's a decline. We talk about that in organizational theory. There's a there's a maturity and then a decline phase, but we don't honor that. It's like with aging in this culture in the West, aging is not particularly honored. It's kind of a pain and let's push those people aside. It's not venerated like in some Asian cultures. So I'm a big advocate of saying there's a time and place for destruction. It doesn't necessarily have to be warlike and filled with fear. It can be done with an acceptance and with no resistance. And there can be sadness or sorrow or mourning, but everything, if you look at a flower, the petals are going to fall off eventually. It's time will come, and that will make space for new seeds and new flowers and new blooming. So that's how I look at the necessity of war and um, the notion of destruction. So I'm curious to do maybe a hypothetical case, a hypothetical case study. Let's say if you, Moshe, were to start a new business, and let's just say you're building education software for, for children, and parents are, are really into it and really want to pay you money for this software, and you were to think about building a business. Like how walk me through just an example of how you would apply these principles that we've been talking about in terms of how you were to build and, and grow this business? Sure. Well, I would start with the higher purpose and recognizing that this is about uplifting kids to be their best mm. by having a good education. Mm -hmm. So I'd stick with that and I'd plaster that all over. I'd have it in my mind. I'd remind myself, I'd remind everyone on my team, this is why we're here. Remember that and come back to that in decisions. And then in saying, well, how do we do this? What's the product or service we're creating? How do we make software that, that does this optimally? We keep looking for, are we delivering on that promise of uplifting and raising kids and doing it in a way that provides connection? And so the product, the innovation and early stage product development would keep cycling back to that. We would think not initially in terms of a MVP as a minimum viable product, we think of MVP as a maximum value product. Mm. So we'd say, what is the most we can do? And again, this is a thought experiment, mm. the very early sure. uh, formulation stage. What is the most we can do to provide value? Let's think really big. And I would go there because what a lot of founders do is immediately restrict their vision to, okay, we have half a million dollars, what can we do? And I say, set time and money aside for this creative phase. And we want to generate a quantity of ideas and get, really go crazy with mm. no boundaries and see what emerges. And we'll come up with things that we wouldn't have thought of if we were constrained by the demands and realities of time and money. So, so that would be the, the innovation product development philosophy of an MVP maximum value product initially, knowing when taking it to market initially, 
we'll have to pick and choose and get closer to the traditional MVP as a minimally viable, but I would shift the language there as well. So that's that's one piece. So it would be keeping employees focused on what matters in product development it would be thinking big about the maximum value and it would be recognizing customers and par parents of kids in particular as active collaborators and bring them in to co-invent and co-create. Hmm. And if this could do anything for you, what could it do? And some parents would say, I wanted to teach my kids and babysit at the same time. Kind of like Sesame Street did for me and my parents. I want your software to do for me. So I want to make sure my kids are safe and I can go do my thing. I can go make dinner or do whatever I need to do. Um, so keeping kids safe and having a virtual babysitter, even though we don't want you to call it that, is one of the unique values you can provide and enlist them as active collaborators and create, this gets to the ABCs, the three pillars of the Amari way, authenticity, belonging, and collaboration. So I'm working backwards. The C is collaboration and treating user, bringing them in much more than is often done as idea generators and saying, you know you better than we know you. You are the experts on you and what you want and have the skills to draw out the right stuff, not expect parents to design the software. We sometimes take things too far and say, well, exactly what, how would you do that? That's not their job. That's abdicating our responsibilities as product developers. Their job is to say, here's the improved state I want. Mm. I want my kid to be saying, I love that. And mommy, let me tell you what I learned today about, about states and the capitals or, or whatever it is. Sure. And, and to feel a sense of connection with that learning. Mm. So that's so, there's the collaboration, there's a sense of belonging. So we would build this in a way and keep asking the question, are we creating connection, the sense of belonging where we want kids to, to feel like this program is part of them and they are part of it. So they're proudly saying, I love that game, game, if they call it a game, if we gamify it, which we probably would. And, yeah. and where it's, it's, it's part of their identity. And the parents are saying the same thing. So we're an XYZ software, if we call it the Ed game, we're an Ed game family. They're identifying it. That to me, that's gold where people mm -hmm. are melding their personal identity with the brand of a company. So that's the, the ABCs, that's the be the belonging. And the A is the authenticity of showing up authentically. And when we don't know things, say, we don't know. We don't know how to do that. We don't know what'll work better and building trust along the way. So authenticity will build trust, belonging creates that, comes from that shared identity and the collaboration is taken to an extreme, is recognizing customers, even the act of purchasing as showing collaboration, collaboration and wishing us success. So those are some ways I would put these principles into action for educational software. That's good. I mean, I like how this infuses all parts of the business. Obviously, you know, there are a lot of lot of words here for the the chief marketing officers and and creatives and people that are communicating with their community managers. And that's you know, the last five ten years that this concept of community management has been um, a, a significant topic. I mean, arguably, this is part of the wave. P brands realize that they need to have this 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 a you know whether they articulate it as an abc or not they need to have the abc and so they hire these community managers to come in and and try to build up a a community from something that obviously is very difficult to do if you're coming from a company that is that this is a massive uphill battle um so maybe another so maybe another hypothetical then let's say you are hired as a community manager or some kind of marketing or branding person to to suss out how to build the ABC for your business. And let's say you have, you know, kind of mediocre buy-in from your, from your higher ups, what would be the actionable steps for those people to help create, create a, a, a community of love on the Amari wave for, for this business? Well, first I would go up. You said there was kind of mediocre buy-in from the higher ups. I would 
wonder out loud. I think mm -hmm. wonder is a vastly underused tool. We, should, mm -hmm. we go to judgment right away. Mm -hmm. I would wonder with them, what do you imagine the community could be like? And what, 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 what do you see? What would that feel like? What would people be saying? Mm -hmm. What would the Wall Street Journal be writing when we're in their headline? Mm -hmm. get, get them to imagine what can be, what is possible and tap into that aspirational sense. We would love it if our customers, if they were saying, yeah, we want the next version the day, the day it comes out. And we wanna share this with everyone. Can you make it easy for me to share this with my siblings or my friends or my community? And, and so from the higher ups, I'd invite them and facilitate a process by which they share the, their aspirational state of what, can, what a community can be. And then move from that to, and how might that translate into revenue? And it might be, and it might be, well, hey, now we're looking at having customer, we're, we're going to do a product extension. So we go from elementary school age kids to middle school age kids. And now we're thinking of customers, we're thinking of the lifetime value of a customer instead of mm. transactionally. And that's a big shift. So our whole metrics are going to change. Mm to align with this vision of what our community can do. So that's one piece I do. And then I go to the community and do kind of a parallel of what can you, based on relationships you have with other software companies, with other um, adjacencies where there's a membership of a belonging of sorts, what's the best experience you have? What, what, what's it like? And what could you imagine the optimal schooling would be like? and giving a lot of examples and kind of going beyond the bounds of traditional, of again, go to adjacencies and then even farther out. So it's wondering, what could this be? And people have enough experience they can draw on and say, you know, I remember when my sister went on semester at sea and went to visit 16 countries as a college freshman and had these incredible life-changing experience. That was one of the foundational growth experiences she ever had. And I'm speaking from experience. My sister did that and it was, but someone could call on that, tap into that. How can we create that in, with a virtual experience? And I wanna be part of that community. I wanna go on that journey with my kids. So get people to imagine what can be. And the exercise of imagining builds community saying someone cared enough to ask and really listen and build is building a relationship around that and there's lots of us who share that particular aspiration connect us and let us grow it with you yeah and on your behalf well that is really i mean that is gold i mean there is there is so much in you know i've worked closely with founders and their their initial cto cmos uh chief sales officer folks around and it just seems like there's a constant running around like a chicken with your head cut off, uh, constant busyness, very easy to forget the central purpose for your company and very easy to forget tying things back in. So this is, this is, this is extremely, uh, extremely wise and insightful for, for folks that might be tempted to think similar to what you said right at the outset. Well, how does this make money? Um, I think some of these meta themes about all businesses are social businesses first, and then and then capitalistically, have, obviously there there are outcomes, side effects that help fuel the social drive of it, um, and 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 on and on and on. So this is this is fantastic. So for people, are are there any um, are in terms of like where you're heading now and in the future? What projects are you thinking about? What 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 are the questions that are that are occupying your mind right now? And what what sort of what sort of things should we, we be looking for you fr from you in in the future here? Well, there's there. <laughs> I love I love the openness of that question. Well, thank you. <laughs> there there's a lot of directions this can grow. And initially, when my book came out about a year and a half ago, I was in retrospect, I was trying to force it to a vision I had. And it took some time to realize this, there's things I can do, 
with my team and there's things I just need to let be and let it evolve organically. So there is a letting go and what I call a trust in the universe. If I'm on the right path and, and there's a calling for this, it'll take hold, but I'm not going to be passive about it and just sit and wait. It's kind of right foot, left foot, chop wood, carry water, do the work to make it happen and continue on that. So one next step is this uh, book that's in the works and I would love for Proda to be in it, as you and I discussed. It's featuring really inspiring stories of leaders who are doing this mm. in their own way and putting the uplifting and connecting energy of love to work in their companies. And then another, so there's a series of books and I'm saying books and maybe it's my generation of thinking and books is, uh, books is the main thing. When I say book, I really mean a, um, a organization of information and inspiration. So it can take the form of podcasts like this, of books, of shows. Um, I envision this leading into a TV show, kind of like The Prophet mm -hmm. with Marcus. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, a show like that where we're going into companies and, and having conversations like this and pointing out here's where I made decisions about putting love to work. And, and, and I am attracting people who want to do that with me, who buy into this vision, say, I can take this part, I can do that part. My, as best I can, my ego is not driving this. It's, I have a role leading this, inspiring, awakening, awakening and inspiring are two of my main jobs, so to speak. And there's others who can take it to very pragmatic, concrete tools from workshops and trainings and so on. So we're looking to grow off that piece of it as it serves the market and the right people who say, yeah, I want in on this at the, at the root level. There's another book I'm working on, and it's called What Would Love Do Now? Mm. And this was inspired by a book, an incredible book called Conversations with God. Um, where that was posed as a really fundamental question. And I, the subtitle is The Essential Question for Leaders Making Hard Decisions. Mm. So, for example, if a company, I remember a colleague was saying, we're out of money, we need to lay people off. So what would love do now? And it doesn't mean being, quote, unquote, nice. No, we're not going to lay them off. I'm going to go into personal debt of a million dollars so I can cover payroll for another three months and we'll, that's not necessarily love. And it's so for hard questions, a, a partner approaches who is offering a lot of money but is not ethically aligned. What would love do in that circumstance? Mm. So it's kind of calling the question and, and, and promoting this idea of let's put love to work. We all do better. So those are some of the directions from this, from a primetime TV show to a series of books and and to build entertainment in this and even make it mainstream through what you and I talked about of combining love and money in a form of cryptocurrency, for example. So there's all kinds of ways to express this. My, my life experience and belief is when we have a truth whose time is here, it, it will be expressed in dozens of ways. Mm. And so that might be Hollywood movies telling this story, kind of the opposite of The Wolf of Wall Street and this primetime TV, TV show and a compilation of songs that from people like Michael Franti, who's an uplifting, this kirtan music I listen to, and, and uh, Alicia Keys, who are speaking to this in their own way so that the message comes in again and again and, and over time changes the paradigm. So love and business becomes the new norm and the new necessity. It's good. It's good. All right. Well, the book, where can people find it? Where can people buy the book? How can people continue the conversation with you? People can get the book at Amazon, all the usual places. They can continue the conversation with me by connecting on any of the LinkedIn, any of the social platforms or emailing me. My, and I'll spell it out, Moshe, M-O-S-H-E at Moshe Engelberg, M-O-S-H-E-E-N-G-E-L-B-E-R-G.com or Moshe at Amare Wave, A-M-A-R-E, wave.com and sign up for my newsletter. I do a newsletter called Amare Wave Wednesday. The idea is 
give a dose of inspiration to encourage people to do one thing, one small thing once a week to put love to work and help grow that momentum. Sign up for the newsletter. And I'm very open to conversations with sincere individuals who say, I want to do this in my company. I want you to coach me or I want to work with you. I want to be an ambassador in whatever form. This is the time to step forward and have those conversations. That's awesome. Well, I will look, I will uh, put the links in, in the show notes for those that, that, that are interested. And Moshe, this has been great. Re- really appreciate your time. A pleasure being with you, Will. Thank you very much. All right, a couple quick things before you go. Number one, I have a general newsletter where I write about technology and startups and health science and teaching people to code. And I write about a variety of different subjects that we talk about on this show. So if you go to wclittle.com, there you'll be able to subscribe and you'll also be able to subscribe to particular topics. If you're just interested in one or a few of them, you'll be notified right when I publish new content in those areas. Number two, my partners and I at Proto Ventures have a portfolio company called Startup Rocket. If you go to startuprocket.com, there you'll be able to receive coaching guides and customize an operations framework for you and your team and your advisors to be on the same page in terms of what is the appropriate next step for you and your entrepreneurial journey. And finally, if you wouldn't mind leaving a review anywhere that you have listened to this podcast or watched this podcast, it'd be super helpful to help those who might be interested in consuming this content as well. Thank you.